eight years. It had been eight long years that Metroid fans had to wait between Super Metroid and the next two titles. No N64 Metroid game, besides the appearance of Samus in Smash Brothers, which did quite a bit to boost her popularity and give more awareness to the Metroid series. But still, for a mainline title in the series of Metroid, fans had to wait. In between the time since the last release of Super Metroid in 1994, we saw the release of Castlevania Symphony of Night, a hugely influential title that not only laid the foundations of how Castlevanias would be for the next decade, but helped spawn the Metroidvania genre, which indie developers would take and run with, especially starting in the later 2000s and early 2010s. Looking to games like Symphony of the Night and Super Metroid as main influences. In late 2002, two titles would drop for Metroid, one day apart, with different studios, on two different game systems, and different approaches. Metroid Prime for the GameCube met with a lot of skepticism with primary development by an unproven studio, Retro Studios, based in America, taking a first-person perspective, something new to the series. Then, there was Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance, directed by Metroid veteran Yoshio Sakamoto, and took a 2D, more classic approach. Or so it would seem. So, how did things turn out? Well, Metroid Prime was able to overcome that skepticism and went on to not just be one of the most beloved Metroid games, but one of the most beloved games of all time. And they were able to bring it to the third dimension, first person perspective. And it paid off. Further producing two sequels and a fourth one to come, at some point, maybe? It's had a bit of a rocky development, but since early 2019, Nintendo is working with Retro Studios again, as they were not before, to get Metroid Prime 4 out the door. And what about Metroid Fusion, the game that we will be talking about in this video? Well, it turned out to be more of a tweak to the Metroid formula, and is a divisive title in the series. While it does have its supporters for the things it tried to do differently, it does have a number of detractors who criticize how it gets away from what made the Metroid game so great in the first place. And this is actually my first time playing through this one from start to finish. So how does it fare up? Well, I can see why it's a divisive title, but I still found it very enjoyable. I commend the team for trying to tweak the formula even if it was a bit hit and miss, instead of just making Super Metroid 2, which would have been so easy for the team to do. In a way, I see a lot of similarities between this game and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, which I've done a video on this channel for the 1999 original. That game had a lot more of a linear approach compared to the looping level design of the first two Resident Evils. Fans both praised and criticized the game, and we also get to deal with a powerful force that we're going to be going against that you're going to be avoiding most of the game. Metroid Fusion also takes a lot more of survival horror influence as opposed to previous titles, which did tip their toes a bit on the horror atmospheric elements, but Metroid Fusion digs in quite a bit more. But my friends, let's dive in. Now that I have a few minutes in between punching boulders, let's hop to it. Let's look at Metroid Fusion. While we're coming up to 18 years since this game was released, Metroid Fusion is chronologically the last game in the series when it comes to the timeline. It's interesting to note that this game is known as Metroid 4 on the title screen as well. Samus returns to the surface of SR388 from Metroid 2, in which she deals with a creature that she's never come across before. This is known as the parasitic organism known as X. X gon' give it to you. Wait for you to get it on your own. X go deliver to you. Knock, knock, open up the Infesting into her nervous system, Samus goes into emergency surgery to have it removed, but requires most of her power suit to be stripped away. A Metroid cell is used to create a serum to remove the virus from her system, which works. We head to the biological space lab ship for the research team, which took this corrupted power suit that they tore off during surgery and stations recently rocked by an explosion. No one's responding. Hmm. I wonder what could be going on here. This is a good point to talk about the redesign of Samus' suit as the surgery has stripped a lot away from her suit and it looks quite a bit different. There was a reason for this. And this comes from an interview with Yoshio Sakamoto, which I will link to. It goes more in depth about the game and the reasoning behind their design philosophies for Metroid Fusion. One of the first designers came in with a pretty big request of saying they want to change the look of Samus because it had been the same for way too long. Sakamoto was hesitant, but he said if the team came up with a reason to justify it, 
he would consider it. He did note that Samus' design from Super Smash Bros. was very popular, so making a huge redesign to her suit was nothing to take lightly. Instead of just changing the design for the sake of design, he really got the team to think of gameplay elements that they could introduce for a solid reason in-game for doing this change in her suit design. As far as justification goes in regards to having this surgery due to this parasite, the one they came up with works quite well. It plays a key part in the plot, which the game puts a lot more emphasis on in previous titles, which we'll get to later in the video. This allows for a more natural way to help the reset the power conundrum that a lot of these games to have, especially with sequels. As this is the last title chronologically, Samus has built up all these powers and acquisitions over the years, so the game has to come up with a good reason to reset them. And this emergency surgery due to this parasite works quite well. It did a much better job than how Metroid Prime or Metroid Prime 2 did this, for example. So when we arrive on the ship, there's an uneasy feeling with the music that's building this dread and a lot of similarities between this intro and Super Metroid. You'll notice right away when playing that Samus controls are a lot less floaty than before compared to Super Metroid or Metroid. It might take a bit to get used to if you just came from those titles like I did, but it's far better overall and it was much better going forward. We come across our first navigation room which tells us where we need to go and we'll be making use of these as the game goes on, more on that later. This X parasite mimics its prey, but due to you having that X within you, you can now absorb the DNA and heal, and you'll be able to pick up some powers and abilities along the way to reclaim. This is further justification to the change in the suit and infection, and is all great stuff. The ship will open up certain doors for us, and we need to find our items to increase our chances of survival, which we can download at data rooms. This is different than before, as we're supposed to found missiles or super missiles to blow these doors open. It's actually going to be on this AI that's going to open it up for us at certain points in the game. Even though it is similar to how in that game it's once you got progress you found these items, then you can backtrack. Here it takes away that agency where we're able to do that, and once this AI decides it's okay for us, then we can move on. It is essentially the same thing, but there is quite a bit of difference because it's taking that agency away from us as the player. We're going to get some inner monologues from Samus throughout the game to kind of get more of an idea of how this AI reminds her of a commanding officer, Adam Malkovich. Adam! And we find out this mention that he loves to call Samus Lady. Lady! Okay, Lady. I get the picture. If we ever find the Lady. Hello, Lady! Early on, we get our missiles. And another note, we do have different controls here, as opposed to using the select button to select missiles. We just simply hold the R button. Much better for a more simplistic controller scheme, and they made good use of the constraints they had as opposed to having more buttons on SNES controller. We first encounter our first boss, a good intro boss, nothing much to really say about it. But after every boss that we defeat, we're going to have to deal with the parasite, which could be a little frustrating where you take down this boss and then you have to deal with this afterwards. It's nothing too difficult, but there was a few times throughout my play where I barely got through a boss fight and then, oh shoot, I have to actually deal with one of these now. We then get the Morph Ball and now we can explore a bit more. Back to the navigation room, we're, we're guided to Sector 1, one of six sectors. And we'll be, around, when we'll be bouncing around these sectors for most of the game. And with that, we see the SAX. I just really like to commend the team how great it was of the, the zoom in on the face, the footsteps, just utterly destroying that door. Those footsteps are still ingrained in my mind. It reminds me a lot of the footsteps from Mr. X in Resident Evil 2 Remake. I've read that many young players were absolutely terrified by the scene, and I could see why. It does a fantastic job of building up this tension, and we know we're going to have to go up against this at some point. And with that, now it feels like a good point to talk about the exploration and the gameplay loop of Metroid Fusion which has caused quite a bit of 
divisiveness amongst the fan base. The nature of exploration in Metroid Fusion greatly differs from the nature of exploration in previous and future titles of Metroid and the Metroidvania genre in whole. Instead of figuring out where we need to go, we are constantly told by this AI where we need to go and what our objective. When we get to these navigation rooms for the sector, it's going to lay out most of the map, if not all of the map, and what, again, what we need to do, taking a vast departure of what came before. Now, why was this the case? Going back to the interview with Yoshio Sakamoto, he did discuss amongst the team that played Metroid saying they felt it was quite hardcore, so one of the things that they had in the forefront of their minds throughout the development is how can we make Metroid easier to play. Now while Super Metroid was divided into clearly defined sections, it didn't verbally tell the player what to do next. So there could be some cases, if you needed guidance, it was mostly a case of elimination to figure out where you need to go next. They saw this as a problem for the development team, but also for players as well. So instead of going through that process of elimination or letting players get lost in this world and trying to figure out where to go next, they removed that portion altogether and told the players where they need to go next. Granted, it's not like modern games that do and they give you like a, a quest arrow or, or something to follow or like a mini map, which I'm talking about how much those can ruin games, but it does really remove some of that surprise and exploration that you would need to do on your own like you would in other titles in the series. It's not like Metroid Zero Mission, which would give you a general idea of where to go next with these Chozo statues, but it would still be a lot more open-ended. That said, it's not like the game lays out everything on the map as you go around. Sector 2, for example, only gives you a small portion of the map to begin with, leaving it up to us, the player, to discover it. And as a result, this area has the most classic Metroid feel. We don't have the whole map layout. There's a number of areas on our way that are inaccessible that we'll have to come back to later. And surprisingly, this is one of my favorite sections of the game. It's nice that not everything has been documented on the map about the ship, and that's actually going to be an interesting plot point that we'll discuss later. Now to note, because this is a Game Boy Advance title, a handheld title as opposed to a console, the game was built in mind to have shorter sessions, and that is something to take into consideration to how they designed and structured this game. On that note, however, the Castlevania line of games on the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo DS but more of that free exploration method, and Metroid Zero Mission would as well take it more back to that blueprint from the original. So with that, some of the exploration that Super Metroid was so well known for gets constrained quite a bit and has been pretty divisive amongst fans. What's funny is in this interview that the director said that one of their key things in developing this game was how can they make Metroid easier to play. And they definitely did that on the exploration side of things. But what about the combat? Well, that's a different story altogether. While exploration is much easier in Metroid Fusion, combat, bosses, encounters, they really amped up the difficulty, especially having just completed zero mission prior to playing this. So that while it is easier to play on the exploration front, this game isn't afraid to kick your ass when it comes to combat. When playing through Metroid Zero Fusion, I died maybe a handful of times, and that was mostly due to more at the end of the annoying mother brain fight. Here though, I died quite a bit and I did what I could to avoid save scumming, which I know is very easy to do, especially since I was playing on the emulator and on the harder bosses here. I've done a video about save scumming in the past. This wasn't just boss encounters as well. This is also normal enemies in exploration. You take quite a bit more damage in this game and you start with quite a bit less health. Now, there are quite a few power tanks that you could pick up along the way. And this game actually has quite a few and even with missile upgrades as well, but it does again justify this whole thing of, well, your suit's been stripped down, you've lost a lot of your powers, so you're going to be taking more damage. More than any other title in the series, with maybe Metroid Prime 2 as an exception, maybe, we're really out of our element here. As opposed to being self-directed like previous titles, we're being guided along by this AI, making Samus feel even less powerful and have less choice and agency than before. That and the higher difficulty gives us much greater sense of isolation. And I don't think other Metroids save from Prime 2 have really hit this feeling of being really out of your element. That's really great that they were able to pull this off. This ties more into the survival horror influences in the game that have always existed in the Metroid series. But here it really goes beyond just dipping its toes in the waters and goes a little bit deeper. 
I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are a lot of similarities here between this game and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, so let's take a look at what's undoubtedly the most memorable aspects of Metroid Fusion. I mentioned earlier this great introduction of SAX, with the footsteps, the zoom in on the face, taking out this door, and we have these encounters along the way with it, with the super bomb, blowing up doors, seeing the destruction it leaves in our wake, and how this SAX will fuck you up very quickly. So comparing it to Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, well, there's a lot of similarities with Nemesis, the main antagonist in Resident Evil 3. There, however, throughout the game, while being pursued by Nemesis, you did have the option of taking Nemesis down. Here, you don't have that option. You run into SAX, you gotta run. Now one of the drawbacks, unfortunately, is the game really could have done a lot more with SAX. It does a great job of building it up at first, of keeping us our distance away and seeing the destruction in its way. Now this could be hardware limitations or design difficulties, but I would really love to see SAX make more random appearances throughout the game as opposed to having these scripted areas where we encounter it. Again, though, I'm sure it probably has something to do with the hardware limitations, but I really, really would love to see them go quite a bit more with this emphasis of SAX and having more encounters, especially later in the game. You can see the team learned a bit from the SAX design and incorporated that into Metroid Zero Mission, where at the end of the game we're dealing with space pirates without our suits, and we're sitting ducks so we have to stealth our way around. And that was one of my favorite sections of the game in Metroid Zero Mission, which was a great addition as a remake. Until finally we come face to face with it at the end of the game, and well, it's a tough fight. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the Dante Virgil fights in Devil May Cry 3, because you're fighting someone who is very similar to you, even though there are some slight differences in their powers. And even at the end of the game, once we reclaim most of our powers, this is still not an easy fight, and SAX will still mess you up if you're not careful. We get our patented Metroid escape scene, but we encounter an Omega Metroid in which SAX tries to fight it off, and we end up absorbing it and taking down this Omega Metroid. It's a really interesting way of tying that all together with SAX and Samus. And with that, that's how the game ends. But let's dig into the plot and the story a bit, because it's been 18 years since chronologically nothing has come past this title. At the beginning of Super Metroid, we got a bit of exposition from Samus, but that was it, and the rest was all environmental storytelling. Here, well, I mean, after the intro, we get quite a bit of this exposition from Samus, or being told by this AI Adam of what we need to do next and where we need to go. Sometimes on these elevator rides, we'll get some more insights from Samus on their thoughts about how the AI reminds her of Adam or SAX. We kind of get into this rhythm and we think things are going to go as is. And then things change up a bit. We start getting into areas that we probably shouldn't be. No entry without authorization. Warning, no entry without authorization. Eventually we make our way down to a restricted zone and well, we discover what some of these researchers were working on. What do we have? Well, a Metroid breeding program able to make them in days. What could possibly go wrong with that? From there, Sam is talking to the AI. We learn the Federation's plans to research the SAX for military purposes. This is a classic science fiction trope and pulls heavily from the Alien franchise. Of course, plays a large influence on the series of Metroid. That being taking some dangerous creature to try and research for the good of humanity, but we all know too well what could happen as a result, especially what Samus sees with the SAX. So as we go and try and take it down, the AI locks us down in this room and says we're not going anywhere because the Federation is going to take care of this. But we're trapped. And here we get some dialogue from Samus and she calls the computer Adam. Adam! To which the AI reacts to, only to grant her this wish and calls her Lady as well. Hello, Lady. We learn that Adam had been uploaded to this AI. Not only that, he suggests to alter the station's orbit so we could take out the planet SR388 below with it. The whole Lady Adam lines are a nice little payoff on what's been going on in Sam's thoughts. Simple, but it works quite well. Once we finish off the SAX and the Omega Metroid, we escape and well, as I mentioned, as far as the timeline goes in Metroid, nothing has taken place after this. 
So now we have this really interesting situation where Samus has destroyed this research facility and she's destroyed this planet. And obviously there's going to be some consequences for it. And that's a really interesting premise for a future title. And, well, it's almost been two decades, so it's a few more years to maybe we'll see something finally in the future. After being many years on hiatus, Samus Returns, a remake in 2017, the Another Metroid 2 remake doing quite well. Well, maybe we'll finally see some things. And what's actually interesting about the Samus Returns remake in 2017 it was actually pitched initially to Nintendo as a remake of Fusion. But hey, with Prime 4 coming around, I'm sure we'll see another 2D game in this series, and it'll be really interesting to see where the story goes after this, because it ends on a really interesting note. So overall, playing through this, I could see why it's a bit of a divisive title in the franchise. I commend the team for trying to change up the formula instead of making Super Metroid 2, which would have been so easy for them to do. That said, the changes that they made either missed the mark or fell a bit short, even if they were some nice changes. For example, SAX being one of the major factors and the reason that people point so much praise towards the game, I'd really love to see the game go deeper with this and implement more encounters with SAX. I would love to see random encounters with it, and again, maybe it was a design difficulty or hardware limitation, but man, that would have been really cool. Still to have this cold, heartless, powerful version of yourself to deal with, and is far more powerful than you throughout the game, is a really simple yet great hook for a great antagonist. Exploration being more streamlined is the game's greatest weakness, and for their next title, the team would work on Metroid Zero Fusion to give an update to the original Metroid. All things considered, I am glad the team did try some different things, even though they missed some of the mark. We also have to remember this is still fairly early on in the timeline of Metroid. This is just before Prime came out around that time as well. We also got two more titles in the Prime series, and since then we've seen, especially in the late 2000s and early 2010s, the explosion of games influenced by the Metroid series, and especially with amongst indies, in regards to Metroidvanias. As far as the 2D titles go in the Metroid series and the Metroid series overall, this one does rank lower in my preferences, but that's by no means is it a bad game. I could appreciate for the challenges and the risks it took and making some changes, even though it didn't quite pay off all the way. As I mentioned earlier, it could have just been so easy for them to make Super Metroid 2, but they didn't and they tried something different. So that's my thoughts on Metroid Fusion. I'd love to hear how you feel about the game, whether you enjoyed it, you didn't enjoy it, how you felt about SAX, the exploration, the difficulty, where it stands amongst your, where it stands amongst your rankings in the series. Please leave a comment about that. Subscribe if you like that. Hit that notification bell or whatever it is. Leave a like. I love to hear back from you guys. Anyways, I've been going at this for a bit long, so I gotta go back to punching some boulders. So, take care everyone.